Okay, it's a great pleasure to welcome um, welcome Chio from the University of Virginia. We'll be giving this lovely minute course. Let's, uh, without further ado, take it away. Okay, thank you, Ben, for for the introduction and the uh, invitation. And uh, it's not a, a especially exciting time, but uh, I hope everybody's at least keeping safe. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the categorification, uh, a small program of uh, categorification at Prime Roots of Unity that I. Uh, started working with uh, my collaborators, uh, my former advisor, Mikhail Kovanov, and uh, uh, Ben Elias, and uh, Josh Sazen. And so it will be uh, divided into three lectures. And uh, the first part will be about uh, why we want to do this, the background, and uh, categorifying the, uh, uh, the linear algebra, uh, not even the linear algebra, the field theory over, over this uh, subject. So the categorifying uh, the ring of cyclotomic integers. Then we'll start categorifying linear algebra and algebra over this subject. So that's categorifying uh, modules or uh, algebras over this ring, OP. And uh, in particular, we'll be interested in quantum groups. That's a, a very important subject being uh, quantum topology and uh, its representation theory. So finally, I'll be describing a categorification of tensor product representations uh, of, of this, uh, of quantum groups, uh, in particular, UKL so two at a root of unity, a piece root of unity. So uh, to start, I, I want to uh, fit uh, this, this, big, uh, this small program into a big, bigger back, uh, background story of uh, uh, topological quantum field theory that's started by, uh, uh, initiated by uh, the great mathematician Atia and uh, Zigo, et cetera. So uh, recall that uh, roughly speaking, the topological quantum field theory studies uh, how manifolds, manifolds evolve in space-time, and uh, as uh, uh, and to uh, evolution of manifold, you assign uh, the evolution of its cor corresponding space of quantum states. So, uh, so evolution of, quant uh, of a manifold is described by a higher uh, dimensional manifold with boundary. So, with the uh, manifolds with boundary, and uh, uh, so to this boundary manifold, you assign the corresponding uh, boundary. Uh, state or Hilbert space of quantum states. And as it evolves in time, uh, it, uh, the uh, corresponding uh, spaces change uh, uh, functorially. So, well, the uh, notion topological here means that unless uh, the manifold goes through topological uh, changes, uh, the, the quantum states assigned to these manifolds or, or, uh, or our world uh, do not change drastically. So, uh, Atia and Zigo uh, define certain uh, coherence axioms uh, uh, of this quantum field theories. And uh, so uh, I'll refer you to uh, uh, Atia's famous article on topological quantum field theory, uh, introducing the celeb celebrated work of Jones, Witten, et cetera, uh, as, as an introduction. So uh, by now, or in the uh, uh, late 80s and early 90s, there, there were many famous examples uh, is established in dimension three and four. So in dimension three, uh, we have the famous Chern Simons, Witten, or and, and Jones theory that describes quantum, uh, uh, quantum groups, uh, well, uh, can be described by uh, using quantum groups at roots of unity. Uh, so that's the work of Rush Thinking QRF or QRF v -Row. And there are many uh, variants uh, of the theory uh, by Cooperberg, Henning, uh, Kaufman, et cetera. So uh, a common feature is this, this takes in, uh, into the uh, input of a finite dimensional Hopf algebra, uh, like a quantum group at the root of unity and outputs a topological quantum field theory. So there's a, a plenty or abundant family of such quantum field theories in dimension three. But in dimension four, uh, the examples are much more uh, sporadic. So the famous examples are Donaldson floor homology theories and the uh, cyber witten theories. So, uh, Unlike in dimension three, many of these previous examples have combinatorial constructions in dimension four. Uh, most of this, uh, these, these two examples are gauge theoretical in nature. So they're defined using very hard analysis and it's not really easy uh, to compute any of these explicit uh, uh, topological quantum field theories. So uh, Therefore, uh, Crane and Frankel proposed th this very bold conjecture in the, uh, 1996 uh, that they, they observed that Donaldson floor homology theory behave functorially very uh, 
similarly to uh, Cooperberg's UQSO2 plus uh, invariant of three manifolds. So roughly speaking, this Cooperberg's invariant is like a three manifold cross S1 and uh, uh, then you take the donaldson fleur homology. So it behaves very similar to that uh, theory. And nowadays we know that Cooperberg's UQSO2 plus invariant is a close relative of witten rush thinking to RAF 3D TKFT associated with uh, UQSO2, so up to some squaring or something. So this is uh, witten rush thinking 3D TKFT of uh, UQSO2. And so, uh, and here the UQSO2 can be replaced by any uh, finite dimensional Hopf algebra uh, or a braided uh, finite dimensional Hopf algebra. And so they conjecture that, well, via the process of categorification, maybe you can give a, a four, uh, combinatorial construction of 4D uh, TQFTs. And in turn, this would help you compute uh, the uh, analytically defined Donaldson floor or cyborg weighton theory uh, you have seen before and discover new families of uh, four dimensional topological quantum field theories. Uh, a caveat here is, uh, as I emphasize, Q is a primitive and of unity so that the Hopf algebra UKSO2 is really a finite dimensional Hopf algebra uh, combinatorial with this. So uh, at the time when uh, Crane and Frankel proposed this conjecture, uh, uh, this was very uh, um, not quite widely believed. Even Witten thought it was not uh, not really realistic uh, from gauge theoretical point of view, but uh, evidence uh, immediately appeared. So the first uh, important evidence was Kovanov homology and its generalizations like kovanov rodzanski homology or uh, even further uh, uh, Webster homology uh, uh, recently. So which gives rise to a functorial link invariant at a generic Q value. So this Q is generic at this point, but uh, it gives a homological link invariant that's functorial with respect to the uh, link involution in, in uh, space-time, as, as we will see what it means in the next slide. So similarly, there is a, a Hegel floor homology theory, which is slightly, uh, uh, somewhat more successful uh, than even Kvan homology uh, due to Ausfuss and Zabo, because it uh, turns the cyborg witten theory into a combinatorial construction so that uh, gauge theoretical invariants can be obtained combinatorially. And it gives rise to categorical invariants for, for both links and three manifolds. Okay, so, so the dividend of categorification is uh, what we gain in the story is uh, functoriality. As we have said, it's a functorial uh, link invariant with respect to a link uh, evolution in time. So, uh, uh, fitting this back into the uh, framework of topological quantum field theory. So as your link uh, evolves in space time, so it traces out a, a two manifold with boundaries, uh, with, uh, with boundaries of the links. So S is a surface, a certain genus that, uh, uh, whose boundaries are the links L0 and L1. And to this, uh, to this data, you assign uh, Link homology theories of the boundaries, Kvan homology or Hegar floor homology of uh, L0 and L1s. And to the surface, you assign a map between homology theories. So these are bigraded uh, uh, abelian groups, and there is a map between abelian groups. When you pass to the Euler characteristic level, you lose this uh, assignment to the surface. So uh, when you pass to the Euler characteristic level, you, uh, you recover this uh, Jones polynomial or the Alexander polynomial uh, in the story, but uh, to the surfaces, you don't gain uh, much information out of uh, the 3D uh, theory. Okay, so this is, so uh, this is much of the background. So we want to turn uh, Kvan homology or hegel fro homology into a, a root of unity story. So this, uh, so this can be a, a, a can be used to fully realize the uh, Crane and uh, Franco dream. So, uh, and, and to do this, we want to uh, uh, go back to uh, review an important tool used in the study of uh, 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 study of link homologies, or more generally mathematics. So, this uh, homological algebra. This is the subject of homological algebra. Any questions? So, this is a background. Uh, I've been uh, quite uh, vague about the. <laughs> 
uh, certain things, but I hope everybody is okay with that. So now let's turn to uh, uh, the important tool of homological algebra uh, used in categorification or Kavanaugh homology or uh, Hegar Flor homology. So let's start with the basic features of homological algebra and uh, for simplicity we'll be working always working over a field uh, and so things become uh, slightly simpler uh, so the basic objects of studying homological algebra are chain complexes uh, over a field so if you want to think about it this is just a graded vector space a k bullet so bullet i'm using the cohomological uh, convention so that d increases the degrees of k, uh, the bullet, and uh, equipped with uh, uh, endomorphism d, so d squared, such a d squared equals zero. So to this data, you assign the notion of a cohomology, which is uh, in each degree, you take the kernel of d mod the image of d. So that's uh, turns out to be an invariant of these chain complexes up to homotopy. Okay, so. Um, so what can you do with uh, chain complexes over a field? So uh, it's very easy to see that uh, uh, if you have two chain complexes over, a, over uh, this ground field, if you can take their uh, direct sum, it's still a chain complex. So uh, if you have two elements, let's say K and L, lowercase K and L are homogeneous elements, uh, you take their uh, differential, it's just component-wise differential DK and DL. So, uh, of course, it satisfies d squared is still zero uh, because it's acting component wise. And likewise, uh, slightly less obvious is the fact that you have the uh, so called tensor product structure on the uh, chain complexes. So if you have two graded vector spaces and their tensor product k dot uh, tensor l dot is a chain complex. So uh, here, the differential is obtained by applying the uh, super Leibniz rule. So dk tensor L is, you first apply it to dk uh, tensor L, then uh, with this correction of sign, k tensor uh, dl. Using this, you can see that uh, where this minus one to the degree of k uh, uh, is used to uh, make sure that d squared is, is again zero on this graded vector space k uh, tensor L, okay? So even less obvious, uh, not really emphasized enough is the uh, fact that there is another construction homological algebra of uh, inner harm. So this is uh, the chain complex harm between two graded chain complexes. So if you have two chain complexes, K and L, uh, you take uh, the direct sum of all uh, homomorphisms, homogeneous homomorphisms between uh, K and L. So harm dot K is, uh, degree, uh, uh, those maps that raises uh, the degree of K dots by, by the corresponding uh, dotting harm. So it's uh, graded harm space. And D of F, uh, if you pick any homogeneous map, F, let's say of degree K, uh, a degree I from a K bullet to L bullet. So it's a, it's a map that raises the degree of elements in K by, uh, by I and D applied to F applied to K is uh, by definition D applied to F applied to K. So that's an element in L subtracting, uh, super subtracting the minus one to the degree of F, uh, F applied to D. So this is the super commutator relation. Okay, so the degree of F is I in this case. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna sweep under, under the rug that uh, the, the rest of uh, homological algebra you see uh, in standard te textbooks. So those are called triangulated structures. In particular, there's the so-called homological shift. Uh, it shifts the degrees of element, uh, complexes K up by or uh, down by one because I'm using homological, cohomological convention. And there is a, a cone construction. So if you have any morphism of uh, any map of complexes K to L, then you can form its cone. And furthermore, any short exact sequence of chain complexes give you distinguished triangles in, uh, uh, in the triangulated category of uh, uh, chain complexes up to homotopy. And uh, these distinguished triangles are bound by the uh, 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 Verdier-Grothendieck axioms TR1 up, up through uh, TR4, okay? So 
Uh, let's ignore part four for now. And we'll digress to, to say why, uh, uh, why it's so useful in categorification. So it's a biased opinion. Uh, so a biased reason is that uh, uh, in a nutshell, homological algebra is a, a systematic lift of abelian operations. So it's, uh, it's so if you um, taking Euler characteristic sends a chain complexes to its Euler number. So it's alternating sum of its uh, uh, dimension of uh, each graded space, uh, graded piece, or uh, equivalent, it's alternating sum of its cohomology groups. So here we're assuming the uh, uh, chain complexes are bounded uh, in, in some sense, at least the homologies are in concentrated in finite degree, uh, finite many pieces and uh, it's, uh, uh, and each in each degree it's a finite dimensional. So to each chain complex, such chain complex, you assign its Euler number and to the uh, direct sum, you assign the addition of these numbers. So addition of this uh, Euler characteristics and to tensor products, you assign the multiplication of these Euler numbers. And uh, the, the homological shift becomes multiplication by minus one uh, in, in Z. Okay, so this is uh, the familiar features of homologic algebra. And uh, there is a very useful variant in homological algebra called the graded, homolog graded homological algebra, or if you work in algebraic geometry that's considering C star equivariance uh, or C star equivalent varieties or things like that. So sometimes it uh, makes things a lot easier with, uh, for instance, localization methods. So here you consider graded chain complexes over, over the field K and you can take the graded Euler characteristic. So that's uh, uh, the graded dimension of uh, each, homo uh, each homogeneous piece and the gradient shift functor, which is orthogonal to the uh, homological shift becomes multiplication in ZQQ inverse. So this is what's called uh, the quantum uh, uh, polynomial ring, uh, quantum integers, uh, quantum integer ring. That's where uh, uh, the Jones polynomial or Alexander polynomial uh, live over. So, uh, all right. So that's the biased reason why I think uh, you see so many ap applications of homological algebra in uh, categorification because that's the, uh, uh, the basic field theory for uh, for this uh, ba basic ring theory for the subject. So observe a, a simple observation if you have taken any uh, course in basic representation theory of finite groups is that the, the above features one through three as we have seen for uh, homologic algebra. So forming, having direct sums, uh, having uh, tensor products or having uh, in, in inner homs are really reminiscent of representation theory of, uh, for instance, finite groups or their linearization uh, group algebras and sl even slightly more generally, uh, Hopf algebras. So what is a Hopf algebra? So uh, a K algebra H is called a Hopf algebra if there are uh, algebra homomorphisms delta from one copy of H to two copies of H. So co-multiplication called uh, and a co-unit from H to K and the antipode map, antipode map H to uh, H opposite, such that certain uh, coherence axioms are satisfied. So for instance, uh, Delta is co-associative and uh, it's come, uh, epsilon serves as the co-unit of Delta and uh, uh, S, S serves as the uh, convolution uh, uh, inverse of the identity map under, on, uh, in, in, in this algebra. But, uh, I don't want you to uh, force yourself to memorize these axioms for now, but uh, uh, you can deduce these properties out of what you want from the uh, representation theory of H, as we have seen. So, so let's see. If H is a half algebra equipped with this, these maps, uh, co-multiplication epsilon uh, uh, S, so how do you actually want to, uh, want to impose those structures uh, uh, from the, its representation theory? So if you have K and L are H modules. So uh, uh, here K and L are arbitrary H modules. Of course, you can form its direct sum. It's still an H module. Okay, so this is true for arbitrary algebra. So if you have uh, two modules in, over an arbitrary algebra, uh, the uh, H X component wise on the direct sum of two modules makes it a, makes it, uh, a module. So that's part of the uh, abelian 
category structure on the H mod category. So that's clear. But uh, uh, what's important for half algebra with uh, delta map is that uh, you can use it to define a tensor product structure. So if you have two representations of H or uh, modules over H, the vector space tensor product. So when I, whenever I use uh, uh, a tensor product without any subscripts, that means a tensor product over K, uh, it's again an H module. So what you do is you use the algebra homomorphism delta. So this map, as we said, delta is an algebra homomorphism from H to two copies of H. You can, um, you can uh, pull back uh, a K, uh, H tensor L where uh, two copies of H act uh, component wise uh, to get a single copy of map of a uh, single copy of representation of H. So uh, this is re uh, this requires uh, Delta to be an algebra homomorphism. Okay, so uh, and to get the first axiom of half algebra, you want this tensor product to be associative. So you, you do want some co associativity uh, on this uh, Delta. So that gives you the first axiom. And likewise, as for, uh, and then using this, you can define uh, the, these, these structures, you can define the inner homs. So this is for, if you are given uh, two rep H representations and the harm space, that's the space of all, uh, all K linear maps between K and L is again an H module. So here uh, you apply uh, H dot F is another map from uh, K to L and you use, uh, when you apply it to an element of K, this is defined as follows. So here we're using, again, Swidger's notation. So sum of, over uh, the second component applied to F of S inverse of the first component of H applied to K. Okay, so this is uh, how you define this structure. So in particular, when L is the ground field, what you obtain is uh, the dual representation of K. So in particular, uh, if, uh, the H2 action would be trivial uh, uh, on, on the right-hand side. So the necessity of uh, having an antipode map S is that you can uh, uh, essentially define the dual representation uh, in, in H. And uh, you, can, you can check that the tensor and HOM are adjoined to each other in the, uh, uh, in the category of uh, uh, representations. So that's uh, an important construction. So, and the essentially HOM of, uh, if K and L are finite dimensional, uh, K, HOM K, uh, into L is equivalent to uh, K star tensor L under this under this action. So you, you do need to require S to be an, uh, uh, to, to be uh, uh, an antipode uh, to define this uh, dual space representation. So uh, before we take a break, maybe Ben said well, we need to take a break after 25 minutes. So before we take a break, let's look at some basic examples of uh, uh, half algebras. So first off, of course, to study representation theory of uh, finite groups, you, uh, you linearize to make a group algebra, so it becomes an algebra that's, that's associative, uh, and it's, it comes naturally equipped with the half algebra structure where uh, the uh, basis elements uh, coming from G are uh, satisfies delta G equals G tensor G. So these are uh, called group-like elements in the theory of half algebra, so because, uh, well, they come from the group G. And uh, the uh, half algebra structure is given by epsilon g is uh, equal to one and s g is g inverse. Okay, so, and secondly, uh, this is actually the first example of, uh, of half algebras uh, discovered by, uh, by a half beyond group algebras, I guess. Uh, and actually, so that's a misnomer. So uh, g is a compact Lie group and its cohomology, uh, cohomology ring is actually half super algebra. So uh, it's a graded half super algebra. Uh, uh, for instance, if you take G to be the compact group UN and the cohomology ring is uh, generated by uh, uh, odd degree generators. So they super uh, anti-commute. Uh, so the anti-commute, so they super commute in the super vector space category. It's the exterior algebra on these DIs and each DI has degree two I minus one. And all these DIs satisfy delta DIs, DI uh, plus uh, tensor one plus one tensor DI. So on modules, you will see that these DIs behave like derivations. So uh, because of, uh, because of this, this relation delta of DI equals DI tensor one plus one tensor DI. Uh, so on modules, when you use the delta to pull back representations, you see that it, they act as super der derivations. 
and epsilon di equals zero. So on trivial representations, di always act as zero, and on dual representations, di act as negative di. And uh, finally, uh, more classical example, if you have a G Lie algebra, which is a linearization of a Lie group, then you can form the universal enveloping algebra, which comes from the tensor algebra quotient relations generated by the commutator relation x tensor y minus y tensor x is equal to the commutator of uh, d bracket of x, y. So this is a half algebra. So uh, for any x, again, this such x are uh, primitive elements, delta x equals x tensor 1 plus 1 tensor x. So on, on, on representation, tensor product representations, x act as uh, derivations. And on trivial representations, uh, x acts as zero. And on dual representations, x acts by minus x. So this is a linearization of the first example where s acts as g inverse. So if you think about g equals exponential of px and take a derivative, you get the uh, third example. OK, I think this is a good point to uh, take a little break and uh, allow many questions. Uh, any questions? All right. We'll, we'll resume again at 10.30 or 1.30 or whatever time it is. Yeah. But please ask questions. What was the Hoff motivation? Why he introduced this? Did anybody? Uh, we'll see this uh, in the next slide. So. <laughs> Because uh, earlier we said that the uh, uh, basic features of, of, of uh, homological algebra is very similar to representation theory of half algebras. Uh, the third three things you see, one, these properties, you can form a, a direct sum, you can form tensor product, uh, you can form uh, inner homs, and you can do this for representation theory of uh, half algebras as well. So this is, uh, this is the reason. So we want to use this theory to explain uh, homological algebra, uh, using representation theory of half algebras to explain homological algebra. But Hoff probably, but, Hoff, but he, he, didn't, he was not interested in categorification. He probably had some concrete topological applications in mind, no? So I'm just curious. Uh, half algebras. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Half algebras play many important roles in categorification or in, uh, uh, in, um, in topological quantum field theory. So they're, they're um, more abundant in dimension three. So where uh, there are shadows, uh, that, uh, they come in as, as quantum groups or representations of quantum groups. Uh, and in dimension four, that's the essential part of uh, conjecture of Crane and Frankel. So there are some higher analog of half algebras, like half categories that dominate or uh, control the behavior of uh, a four-dimensional topological field theory. So it's, that's a topological motivation. But so far, we still are uh, we're missing the axioms of half categories. That's, uh, I don't know if there are agreed upon uh, notions of half categories. So earlier, there's a question from Adam Childcraft. By dimension three, we mean a three manifold with a two dimensional boundary. Uh, yeah, that, that's what it means for 3D peak of T, exactly. So just a small just thing. A small thing. Um, I think that uh, for the graded half algebra, for example, the uh, cohomology of Lie groups, uh, I think you need the, the co-multiplication to be one on the zero degree component because it has to be a, a, an algebra map, right? Uh, come again? Yes, yes, that's true. Um, let, let's start continuing, Gio. Oh, okay, great, so, all right, so, 
After observing these examples, let's go back to homological algebra and uh, revisit homological algebra in terms of representation theory of half algebras. So in particular, we're gonna use this compact Lie group uh, G example, and G actually equals U1 in this case, which is a circle. Um, and think about homological algebra as representation theory of the graded half super algebra KD over D squared. So I, I think the notion of half super algebra is a misnomer. So we should always think about half super algebras as half algebras because they were really the first half algebras beyond group algebras uh, discovered by half. So, uh, so a natural question to ask in at this point is, are there other features of homologic algebra present for H modules? So whenever H is a general half algebra. So for instance, what are taking cohomology for H modules, right? And uh, what are the uh, triangulated category structure on H modules? So this is, uh, for instance, some, some uh, questions you, you can uh, bear in mind. Uh, so to answer this question, let's go back to homological algebra uh, and uh, re-examine it uh, using representation theory of uh, H modules, where H is KD over D squared, the uh, cohomology ring of uh, U1. So, because this ring is so small, uh, it's representation theory is very easy to understand. So it's KD over D squared. So it's a K vector space endowed with a K linear endomorphism of uh, uh, satisfying D squared equals zero. So uh, using basic linear algebra, for instance, like uh, 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 drawdown canonical forms, because it's neopotent, you don't even uh, need to uh, require the field to be uh, algebraically closed that there are only two types of uh, uh, indecomposable modules. So any vector space, graded vector space, decomposes using a Jordan canonical form into one with a single Jordan block sitting in a certain degree uh, i. So this is the first type of module. And uh, the other one is a Jordan block of size two because d squared equals zero. So this is uh, 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 the second type of uh, modules where the uh, their map d acts as uh, uh, the uh, isomorphism between a uh, single copy of K. So here this K can be sitting in some degree I where I, uh, so RI depends on I and uh, here this is the degree I, I plus one because raises degree and uh, this, this is SI. So this RIs and SI uh, may well be infinity, but uh, because this uh, half algebra is so, e uh, so easy to understand, it's there, these are the only type of modules. So using this representation theory, you see that, uh, or linear algebra, you see that what taking cohomology does is that it uh, functorially uh, annihilates the second kind of uh, factors in this theory. It only keeps the first kind of, uh, first manageable uh, part of the complex. So these are usually the uh, uh, Im important invariants associated with the chain complexes and it annihilates those contractible complexes. So these are uh, the second uh, Jordan type is called uh, contractible ones. So what's, what's special about this uh, type of uh, complexes and why we want to kill them is that, well, uh, uh, somewhat obviously this is isomorphic to the uh, upgraded projective module. It's actually graded free module KD over D square. So if you think about KD over D square, you place K times one in one degree and multiplication by D sends it to KD. So this is uh, uh, the degree raises by one. So you can use the gradient shift functor to make this sitting degree I, then this automatically sits in degree I plus one. So uh, obviously this is a, a graded projective uh, or free module. And slightly less obvious is the fact that they're also uh, injective. So uh, essentially this follows from the fact that uh, 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 there is a Poincaré uh, duality on, on the cohomology ring of S1. So you can use uh, the duality uh, to, to, to send uh, do, uh, uh, in, uh, the dual of this, this module is isomorphic to itself. So the dual of any projective module is injective. So uh, you see that this, this module is also uh, injective. So what's important about injective is that whenever you see a module where K, uh, 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 where there's this, this one copy of K where D acts non-trivially D uh, in K, so it's not zero, then this splits out as a direct summand uh, in, this, in this chain complexes. So more generally, if you have an injective module over an algebra, 
and it occurs as a, a sub-module inside some a bigger module, you can always split it off. So, it's a, uh, so that's why injective modules are uh, useful. Uh, but in general, they're pretty hard to describe, except for this very small algebras, like a finite dimensional half algebras, uh, as we will see uh, in a sec. Uh, so now our earlier question of what taking coho module is can be translated uh, for, for H representations can now be translated into, so uh, first off, when are projective H modules also injective? And we want to uh, uh, we want to functorally uh, kill these objects in the H representations that plays the role of taking cohomology. So if we take, uh, if we uh, kill projectives and injective objects in uh, H representations, that's behaving like taking cohomology. Okay. So to do this, I want to quote a very classical theorem of Larson and Switter that uh, goes back to the 1960s or 70s uh, that says that if you have a half algebra over the ground field K, then H is Frobenius if and only if H is finite dimensional. So being Frobenius just means uh, as the cohomology ring of compact Lie groups, there is Pangari duality uh, there. So there is a non-degenerate trace map from, uh, from H to the, uh, to the ground field. So you can turn projectives into injectives. Um, you, can, you can make projectives dual isomorphic to, uh, to an injective. So this uh, still have so this this is what Frobenius means. Um, so in particular, for finite dim dimensional half algebras, uh, projective H modules are always injective H modules. So when whenever you see uh, a projective module occurring as a summand uh, in some uh, occurring inside a big big module, you can always split it up uh, split it off because it's always injective. Okay, so algebraically, that's why uh, this this case is uh, more important. And now we want to just systematically uh, kill, this, kill these modules from H representations. So that brings us to the next topic. So this is the stable category and the topological algebra. So, so from now on, because of uh, Larson and Switter's theorem, we'll be focusing on finite dimensional half algebras, which are uh, also Frobenius. So uh, their projectives are also injectives and we want to kill the projective injective objects in H representations. So to do this, we define this category. So uh, it's a good lesson for uh, starting graduate students that whenever you uh, uh, work with categories and uh, want to produce functors out of categories, you first never tamper with objects. Then uh, what you want to do is you, you deal with morphisms. So, uh, so the stable category of H modules has the same objects as H representations, so you never tamper with objects, but you want to throw out the projective injective objects in this construction, so uh, you kill all those morphisms that factor through these objects. So for any representations H and K, the homomorphism space between uh, K and L is H intertwining maps between K and L, modulo those maps that factor through P, uh, a projective uh, injective H module. Okay, any questions? So a theorem of Heller that help us answer the earlier question I raised, what's the uh, 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 triangulated structure in uh, H representation is that whenever you have a Frobenius algebra, so in particular a finite dimensional half algebra is always Frobenius, this stable category construction gives you a triangulated category. So in particular you have this Cone construction, and you have uh, uh, you have uh, short exact sequences giving you distinguished triangles. Uh, you have distinguished triangles on the right hand side that satisfy uh, TR one up through TR four. So I want to give you a sketch of how this uh, theorem is proved. Uh, so you can you can uh, I, I just want to point out how you define these uh, basic structures on on the right hand side. So for instance. Uh, how you define shift functors, for instance. Uh, so uh, on H representations, so if you have any module M in H mod, you choose injective embedding uh, or injective covering of, uh, of M as, so often, or and a projective covering map of, of M, so sorry, injective embedding and the projective covering. So alpha, beta, uh, H intertwining maps. So, uh, so uh, they line H mod uh, category and you take uh, respectively, uh, 
the co-kernel and kernel of these maps to define shift by one and minus one. And then exercise for you uh, is to check that in particular, if H is KD over D squared, this agrees with the uh, uh, usual homological shift. And, uh, and furthermore, this is actually independent of the choices of uh, injective embedding and projective covering. So uh, when you pass to the stable category. And secondly, how do you construct cones or distinguish triangles? So, so whenever you have a morphism uh, in this category, you want to construct its cone as we have seen for in homological algebra. So if F is a chain map or uh, if, if F is H intertwining map between K and L, uh, what do you do is, so first you, uh, you embed K inside uh, IK. So that's what uh, uh, we have seen for constructing uh, K shifted by one and uh, together with this morphism F into, into L. Now this, this part, there's nothing else left to do. Uh, in homologic algebra, there's always a unique path uh, always to do. So you just take the push out diagram. So essentially the cone uh, is the direct sum of L plus IK quotient the image of K inside, inside uh, uh, the direct sum module. So there's this commuting square, it's a direct sum. Uh, quotienting some relations. And so in the push out, the uh, co-kernels are, uh, are, are the same. So uh, they're all given by K shifted by one as we defined it. So we will declare this part to be a distinguished triangle. Uh, so this part you see in the diagram, K, L, C, F, and K1. So, uh, and this is a so-called standard distinguished triangle. And uh, in the stable category, any, any uh, any triangle that's isomorphic to this standard one is called a distinguished triangle. So uh, then, uh, use, uh, then you have to check TR1 through TR4. This is kind of tedious, but you can mimic what, what you do in homological algebra uh, for uh, KD over D square and uh, use that method to, to prove it for uh, arbitrary uh, H, H mod. So there's not a much difference in the proof. Um, so, uh, a general question nowadays, uh, well, in, in categorification, you're motivated to understand uh, categories as, as morphism spaces instead of categories of objects. So that's what modern categorification uh, has taught us, so, or modern category theory has taught us. So if you want to understand a category, morphisms are even more important than, than objects. So we want to understand how to compute morphism spaces uh, in the stable category as uh, it's given quite abstractly. So um, uh, to do this, I have to introduce the notion of, uh, of an integral in a lambda. So an integral is an element in H. So some people call it a uh, co-integral uh, because it's an integral in the, uh, uh, the Hopf algebra sense in the dual Hopf algebra H star. But uh, uh, my former advisor, Kovanov, used uh, this no notion uh, integral. So I, I was, uh, always call it an integral. So an element is an integral if it spans a trivial uh, representation inside the uh, left regular representation of H acting on itself. So in, in other words, H for any element H in H, H multiplying lambda is just by a scalar, so epsilon H, a rescaling lambda by epsilon H. Okay, so that's the analog of uh, trivial representation um, in H module representation theory. So, Part of Larson and Switter's proof actually shows that whenever H is finite dimensional, the space of left integrals is always one dimensional. So it's actually used to prove uh, uh, H, is, uh, H is Frobenius. So this is equivalent to say, uh, uh, H is Frobenius if and only if the space of uh, left integrals is one dimensional uh, in, in Larson and Switter's theorem. So, um, so, uh, I want to emphasize using this integral, I want to uh, tell you that how we can compute the morphism spaces uh, uh, more explicitly. But before that, let's look at the examples we have focused on. So first off, uh, if KG is a finite, uh, uh, for a finite group, uh, for a group, H is finite dimensional, the group algebra is finite dimensional, of course, if and only if uh, G is a finite group. So you can take that uh, the integral is just the sum of all elements. This is the usual, uh, usual averaging operator you see in representation theory, so sum of all elements, because uh, this is because epsilon of G is one, as we have seen. So now, if you take the cohomology of S1, uh, this, this is a, a, 
Cohomer algebra in the last one as the uh, graded half super algebra. And the integral is just d. So that's why it's called an integral because uh, this d is the top differential form uh, spanning the top cohomological class in S1. And uh, integrating over d is just integration over, over S. So that's why it's called uh, integral. And so this is uh, uh, coming from the second example we have discussed earlier. And the third example earlier we have uh, thought about is a universal enveloping algebra of a complex semi-simple algebra. And uh, by Larson and Switter's theorem, it's no, uh, there's not an integral in, in it because it's not finite dimensional. But it is, uh, there, there is a finite dimensional half sub algebra uh, if you work over characteristic P. So this is the first, uh, the forbidden kernel of uh, universal enveloping algebras. So in this case, we just take one dimensional vector space and uh, with a trivial lead bracket and consider its universal enveloping algebra, so KD. And uh, so we assume that D is primitive as in uh, the algebra case. And in, over a field of finite characteristic, uh, the ideal of D, uh, D to the pth power is a half ideal, uh, essentially because uh, delta D, as you have seen, is D tensor one plus one tensor D. Therefore, delta D to the pth power, you want, delta is a uh, algebra homomorphism is the same as delta D to the pth power is uh, the freshman's uh, dream formula holds in this case because it's a uh, incursive P. So this is D to the pth power plus uh, tensor one plus one tensor D to the pth power. So uh, you can quotient this ideal and this H inherits, inherits uh, half algebra structure from KD from the uh, universal enveloping algebra and uh, integral is just the top degree element inside it. So uh, delta, uh, I didn't write it. So lambda is d to the p minus one in this case. Okay, again, this is because epsilon of d uh, is, is zero. Okay. All right, so using uh, the notion of integral and the uh, trivial representation, so let's uh, state how we measure the amorphism spaces uh, in the stable category. So harm uh, between two H modules in the stable category is uh, the homomorphism space. Uh, uh, so, so we have earlier constructed this inner harm between K and L. So that's H acts on the entire space. And now we take the numerator to be the uh, H invariance under this action and the denominator. So, so this is a sub quotient in the uh, vector space homomorphisms between K and L. And the quotient is the image ob obtained by uh, applying the integral operator to, uh, to the uh, inner Hamm space. Okay, so I want to outline a, a proof of this fact, uh, but I think I'm going too slow. Uh, but uh, uh, maybe it helps for a graduate course to be, uh, to be slow. But uh, let's, let's continue. So uh, the proof reduces to the following lemmas. So we'll try first off to uh, to use some half algebra representation technique to reduce uh, denominator, numerator, and denominator in this uh, in this expression. So the first lemma is uh, the inner Hamm space when you take H invariants are precisely all those H intertwining maps between M and N. Okay, so so the numerator can be understood as H intertwining maps in the homomorphism space, and this is not very hard to prove. So uh, uh, for instance, if H is in uh, F is an uh, H intertwining map. You want to show that it gives you an invariant on the left-hand side. So H applied to F, so considered as a map. Um, so this is how we define it. H, uh, H2 applied to F with S inverse, H1 applying to the argument. Okay, so this is, but F is uh, linear. So you have, you can take out the S inverse H1. And one of the axioms we have seen earlier is that H2, a multiplied by S inverse H1 is just epsilon of H. So that's how uh, H acts on trivial uh, representations by epsilon. Okay. Is there a question? Um, Don't worry about it. Oh, okay. And conversely, so if F is an uh, H invariant on the left-hand side in the vector space harm, so you can, uh, then F applied to H using the half algebra axioms. Again, you can split out a copy of uh, epsilon of H2. So that doesn't, epsilon of H2 multiplied by the uh, first component is just H. And epsilon of F, you can use this trick we have seen here is epsilon of H 
split into H3 times S inverse H2 of uh, F of H1. So, and now this is uh, exactly the same of, uh, uh, of, of this uh, H2 of uh, applied to H1 acting on F by our axiom. So, and now you uh, do this trick again. So this, this is just because F is invariant. So this is just epsilon of H1. And uh, so this is uh, H, you can take H out. So this is uh, H uh, on the left hand side. So in particular, uh, F, F is H linear. So the second lemma is now we analyze the uh, denominator in this expression, lambda dot uh, harm of K, KL. So if F is in this uh, homomorphism space, then it factors through a projective injective H module if and only if F factors through this uh, M into M tensor H. So by this canonical embedding of identity tensor lambda. So M goes into M tensor H. Okay, so this is a, a, a embedding of M into a, into a, a module of uh, M tensor H. In fact, this is actually a projective module because it's isomorphic to there are some copies of H as we will see later. But uh, now we, we want to just characterize this as those homomorphisms factoring through this canonical map. But to do this, it suffices to show that actually N, when N is projective, so when, or furthermore, uh, when N appears as uh, just H or direct summons of copies of H, so you can reduce it to the case when N is free. So to do this, we consider this embedding of M, both M and H into, uh, into their, this canonical embedding of M tensor H and H tensor H. So, but these are the embeddings. And uh, of course this diagram commutes by, by construction. And because H is injective, so this embedding, as we have said earlier, H is an injective module inside a bigger module, it splits off as a direct summon. So you can find a splitting G over there. So H is injective. So there's a split in G. Now you can just, uh, such a G composed with identity uh, tensor lambda is, is the identity. So therefore F is just uh, commute uh, the, uh, the other way around. So F is just the same as this composition. Okay, so it's very easy because H is injective in this story. And uh, thirdly, so we want to analyze what maps can factor through this canonical map. And this, this such maps are precisely all those maps you ob obtain as lambda applied to a linear homomorphism between uh, harm M and N. Okay, so, and to show this, I, I have split it into two parts, again, using, uh, using the half algebra axioms, and I'll leave the second part as an exercise. So the first, if F tilde is given as below, uh, as above, that factors uh, F, so F tilde composed with identity of lambda is F, then we just define this phi to be F tilde restricted to the copy M tensor K inside this big vector space. So instead of uh, uh, M tensor lambda, you consider a complementary copy, not complementary, it's a, another copy of M inside it, but it's uh, uh, the embedding of M as M tensor K inside M tensor lambda is not H linear. The, uh, this map, because, because lambda spans a trivial subrepresentation, becomes H linear, but when you uh, restrict to this, this copy, uh, the embedding is not H linear, so, but it's useful still to consider it. So phi is F tilde. Then when you apply lambda to, uh, to phi, you get this is lambda to, uh, by our definition of how lambda acts, uh, elements of H act on uh, the morphisms uh, on the uh, inner uh, harms. So it's, uh, it acts, by, by this, this rule, lambda two phi S inverse lambda one apply to M. So, but by definition, phi is just F tilde restricted to this copy S inverse of lambda one M tensor one. So it's embedding using a weird embedding of non H homomorphism embedding. So this, but now F tilde is, uh, is an H intertwining map uh, by assumption. So you can move lambda two inside to use lambda two to act on the tensor factor. So, Lambda two acting on the tensor factor, you see that it's uh, uses co-multiplication. So act on this first copy by lambda two and uh, on the second copy by lambda three. And then again, you see that lambda two multiplied by S inverse lambda one is just a scalar. And uh, so you observe that this is just 
f tilde of m tensor lambda. And conversely, you just essentially reverse all these equalities and I have left this as an exercise for you to, uh, to finish. Okay. So, um, so Gio, it's 1055, so maybe you should wrap up. Oh, okay. So maybe, uh, all right. So let's just at least observe this sing, sing, uh, simple example. So for, uh, we'll continue our discussion of uh, this, this uh, facts next time. So if KG is a semi-simple, uh, uh, if G is a finite group, KG is semi-simple if and only if uh, K is a projective module or injective module in this case. So it's a G is finite group. This is essential because you have this uh, tensor harm junction in half algebra representations. So harm of H of M into anything. So is equivalent to uh, K tensor M, right? Because the trivial representation of tensor uh, M is just, uh, just M itself. But the tensor harm junction allows you to move uh, tensor M to the right hand side. So harm of M, that's vector space harm is always exact. So, and harm of K is, uh, uh, if K is projective is also exact. So the composition of two exact functors is exact. So uh, the left hand side being exact just means K is uh, 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 projective. So uh, this happens even only if the, uh, uh, by the construction, the morphism space between the trivial representation uh, is, is zero. And we use the earlier theorem to measure how big this morphism space is in the uh, stable category. This is precisely H invariance uh, uh, quotient uh, averaging operator applied to the uh, uh, this space, but harm k, harm between k and k in the vector space category is just single copy of k with trivial H action. So this is just k divided by the copies of uh, uh, elements of G and multiplied by by k. So this is a special case of uh, uh, this uh, reduces uh, is equivalent to uh, Masaki's theorem which says that KG is semi-simple if and only if G is uh, invertible in the uh, ground field. Okay, I think maybe, maybe it's a good point to stop. Next time we'll continue our examples. I'm going way slower than I thought I would, but I think it's a good point to stop. All right, let's do the standard silent Zoom clap. <laughs> um, uh, are there any questions? Just so you know, after, after this, um, those of you who wish to stick around and do some exercises, we have some exercises, they're on the website. Um, we can split into breakout rooms. Um, if you want to be put in a breakout room with a particular person, then that can be arranged. Um, you can privately chat. Um, Sarah and Asiri, why don't you, why don't you say something and wave? Um, uh, yeah, just chat me if you want to be in a certain group or a certain breakout room. And, and people can try to do the exercises together. Um, uh, but first, let's ask some more questions of Chio. Or actually, we could just sit here awkwardly. Were there any questions in the uh, chat box? Um, there's a question now. Maybe some typos. Uh, um, the slides, by the way, are on, on the Quex website. There should be a, a link, slides, et cetera, on the, on the right side of the bar. Yeah, see, there are some typos. I'll, I'll correct the typos and I'll reset Ben the updated yeah. notes as well. So. or repos. Um, so can I ask one question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so you, you define the, the stable uh, harm space as a sub quotient. I was wondering, is there any way to uh, define it? I mean, using some uh, analog of this the differential gradient version, like uh, like dream field uh, DT localization stuff. Uh, this actually this is equivalent to the BG when you specialize k equals uh, kd over d squared. This is going to be the uh, inner harm space in the uh, BG category of chain complexes. That's on the exercise sheet. Yeah. In other words, it's like you take the internal harm and then you take kernel of d mod image. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. Thanks.
Ben Cooper asks if you can do hopological algebra with infinite dimensional hop algebras, and this is certainly something that's being worked on. Uh, yeah, there's some preprints on this, I think, by, uh, I forgot the name of the author. But you do want some uh, Frobenius property on the uh, module category. For instance, you can uh, ask the question, when is uh, the representation category of a finite dimensional, of an infinite dimensional half algebra Frobenius, and then do proceed from there. But the answer is rarely, unless H is finite dimensional. So I'm still having a little bit of a hard time parsing some things. So the, the lambda for a finite group is basically the sum of all group elements. Yes. And, uh, if you take the order, you definitely get the order of G. But I mean, I, I still don't see uh, why you're going to get KG in the bottom, just the order of G. I, yeah. Uh, you just I take guess, it okay. because this is a vector space K, right? You take any um, basis elements KV, for instance, then lambda acting on V is just sum of G acting on V. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Representation, right? So this is uh, epsilon, uh, yeah, just order of G multiplying on V. Right, thank you. No problem. Um, why don't we um, stop the recording and go and do the exercises? I think you win everything best by doing exercises. We'll be trolling around through the breakout rooms and helping people with the exercises. So you